Hello everybody, this is Manuel and welcome back to another MTG Arena Contenders video series here on my channel. Today I want to talk to you about a deck that has been flying under the radar a bit uh, so far in the new format and that has been doing way better for me than I would have expected when I uh, messed around with it. I even had so little expectations that even though it was a fairly obvious deck to build, I didn't even try it much because I thought it just not uh, not remotely good enough and at best like a, a mediocre tier 2 deck. But yeah, the performance so far has proven me wrong. So let's take a look at Gruul midrange, like a like yeah, Gruul dragons basically. Um, very similar to the old um, red green dragons in Teros for example. Um, but before we do, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification icon if you're new to the channel to not miss out on future content. And now on to the deck deck. All right, so this is the deck list. It's your very typical curve, um, red green, beat down dragon mid range deck that curves up from one to five. Plays a couple of interaction spells and mostly just a good curve of creatures topped out with a bunch of flyers, dragon like creatures. This time it's not all dragons, it's dragons and phoenixes, but like a couple years ago it was dragons, only like a four drop and a five drop dragon. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the cards. So, oh, actually, before we take a look at the cards, let me explain why I had so low expectations for the deck. I mean, the deck is a very obvious deck to play. It plays all the best cards in the card slot, and there's very little flex room, especially in the main deck, to build the deck any different. Stumbled upon a bunch of lists, and they all basically all look the same. Uh, for obvious reasons, it just plays all the good cards that a strategy like this would want. Um, so... The point with the deck is, it just isn't that aggressive, like it seems worse than an actual aggressive deck because it's less aggressive. It also doesn't have like the value and grind potential of other mid-range decks, and it also doesn't have any like truly powerful, truly unfair cards. All the cards are pretty fair, they are very good and cost efficient for what they do, but they are not very, yeah, like game-breaking. Like there's no Teferi, there's no Vivian Reed, there's no Crisis. There's no History of Benalia, there's no Chain Whirler. None of these powerhouse cards that make and break other decks. No Nexus, nothing. Just a bunch of good creatures that attack well and mostly trade one for one. Um, but yeah, turns out this strategy somehow works really well and does really well in the current metagame for some reason. Um, I am really, really baffled and surprised by the results, but the deck has been doing awesome for me i have been crushing it in uh in like platinum and diamond with it i went all the way from like platinum to diamond three i think i'm at one loss below diamond three again because i had to concede a, a match yesterday that made me drop below diamond three but yeah all in all um the deck isn't losing a whole lot against all the like major decks um that you currently face um so let's talk about the cards. First we have one drops, four land of elves, not much explanation needed here. If you're curving up to five and kind of like a um, curve out style mid-range aggressive deck, land of elf in green is one of the main reasons to be green. So no, no surprises there, card is amazing. Then we have Pelt Collector. This card's actually really powerful, one of the better one drops of the recent years. Uh, quickly ramping up to a 3-3 or 4-4 four, four for one mana. Uh, once it's a 4-4 four, four, it even gains trample, a lot of pressure um, for a one drop, making this version of red green dragons a bit more aggressive and harder hitting out of the gates than older versions, like the last version a couple years ago, um, had less um, one and two drops and they were also not aggressive one and two drops, making it uh, more mid rangey and I think that is part of where the strength of this deck comes from, that it is more aggressive out of the gate, has more haste and uh, therefore applies more pressure and then can kind of overpower and close out the games with its uh, powerful, resilient or hasty flyers at the end of the curve, making up for not being quite as fast and aggressive as your typical aggro deck. And yeah. Uh, next we have the two drops, Gross Chamber Guardian. Uh, without further mana investment, it's not the greatest card, it's a grizzly bear, but the potential to attack with it and threaten to adapt it alone makes it at least a virtually unblockable uh, grizzly bear, which is pretty good. 
And yeah, if you have the spare mana or want to, uh, yeah, want to not commit more to the board, but instead apply pressure and grind out your opponent, you can just adapt, hit for four, get another uh, gross chamber guardian, uh, making this a really good card against more grindy interactive matchups that have a lot of spot removal, like some control decks or more grindy mid-range decks. And then we have Zuatar Goblin, the best two drop in terms of rate. It either against reactive decks hits for two immediately. Um, make sure that against yeah, controlling and combo decks like Nexus decks and Esper Control, especially, you usually want to riot this because it needs to attack four times, uh, like three times, as a three-three to deal one more damage than the haste, and it might attack zero times because your opponent kills it before it gets the first attack in. So this guarantees further, uh, two damage right away usually. And then only uh, after the fourth attack, you're losing out on one damage. And four attacks with this is a lot. So um, that rarely comes up. So if combat with other creatures is not a concern uh, where you need to be like 3-3, three, three, you want to um, haste this to maximize your damage output. And otherwise, yeah, a two mana 3-3 three, three for two is great and standard and outsizes a lot of creatures and uh, forces Mono Red to use a burn spell on this, um, blocks most creatures in White Weenie without any pump effects, and so on and so forth. Just a very uh, good two drop and a big part of why this deck has such a good early game. And also the 3-3 three, three part uh, means that Pelt Collector um, grows easier and quicker even later. Then we have Legion Warboss. This is basically Goblin Rebel Master all over again. Uh, it deals one damage less per turn than Goblin Rebel Master um, because of how its uh, mentor works compared to Rebel Master's uh, ability. But the goblins only have to attack their first turn. After that, you can hold them back to block. And you have also more control about Warboss himself because he also doesn't have to attack. With Rebel Master, it was he and his goblins were always attacking. Uh, and potentially suiciding themselves. To be fair, against bigger blockers, Rebel Master obviously can attack better because it trades with a lot bigger stuff. So bigger blockers are more likely to stall out Warboss. But against interaction, Warboss actually turns out a lot better than our Rebel Master used to in the past. Simply because the Mentor distributes um, the damage output um, of Warboss um, over multiple cards. And also, um, yeah, adds damage. Like initially over the first two turns, Rebel Master would deal seven damage and this only six. But after that, you actually um, end up dealing more damage over time than a Rebel Master would. So you catch up quickly. After uh, the th In the third turn, you're already attacking for 13 total over the first three turns. While with Rebel Master, you add... Um, 8, 14, 15. So, um, yeah. Oh, actually, no, never mind. Rebel Mastery is still ahead because of his ability, so you lose about 8 damage per turn if I'm not mistaken because the Mentor is a bit slower. But the Mentor um, persists, so that gives you um, some additional damage um, effectively each turn and the 1 damage from the turn before. Um, yeah, uh, and once the war boss is being dealt with, leaves a, uh, back a bunch of 2-2s potentially, while Rebel Master would only leave behind 1-1s. One so it is very close to Rebel Master with different uh, up and down sides, and we all know if we played back then how good Rebel Master was. So war boss definitely is a bit of an underplayed and underappreciated card right now, and um, this deck takes great advantage of it, and playing this on the play turn 2 with a land of elves, especially with a way to back it up with like a lightning strike or collision colossus, um, can win games on its own and just snowball really, really hard, uh, just like Rebel Master used to. Then we have Gruul Spellbreaker, amazing card. When you're fighting creatures and blocking, you just play it as a three mana four four trample, which is really, really good. And otherwise, when you're racing and pressuring, you just can play it as a three three trample um, haste, which is also a great raid. And the fact that it has hexproof and gives you hexproof during your turn can also come up uh, nicely, especially against control. They usually have to take the first three damage right away because they can't kill it the turn you play it with haste. 
and then can only kill it after so it's a guaranteed three damage on an empty board basically and yeah sometimes even uh matters against the odd settle the wreckage there aren't many settle the wreckage anymore these days but if there are spellbreaker will deny uh, the use of them so um another pretty good upside then we have for rekindling phoenix the first dragon which isn't the dragon this time around the fact that it has three toughness can sometimes be a bit annoying in blocking and um, against cards like lightning strike to temporarily shut it down but the fact that it just keeps coming back if the opponent doesn't exile it or kill it twice is uh, making up for that easily card is really obnoxious against control decks you can easily play it into their like kaya's ras turn and stuff like that and against creature decks with little removal this just either races them or if you can't race it just brick walls them because every time they attack into it they're just trading a creature away for nothing and so on and so forth so yeah rekindling phoenix really powerful and last but not least we have skag and hellkite uh, not quite stormpress dragon i would say but still pretty good and has different upsides um, when you don't want to attack being able to play it as a 5-5 five five is a pretty big deal means it doesn't die to lava coil for example and beats some other flyers like rekindling phoenix and also you get to use the ability if you do that and the ability while clunky and slow and situational uh, can turn around games especially against white weenie type um, decks for example where you just decimate their board over a couple turns and just kind of run away with the game if this goes unanswered and uh, otherwise you most of the time want to just play it as a 4-4 flying haste to uh, swing a race and uh, yeah beat the opponent in the air and then we have four lightning strike um, lightning strike has been better for me uh, than lava coil would be i think in the main but it's definitely a close consideration the deck is aggressive enough that the lightning strike damage can matter especially against controlling decks but um, depending on how the meta game shakes out it is imaginable that you want lava coil main if there is enough i don't know need to kill tempest gins uh, which lightning strike can't but it's fine you have like collision for that and lightning strike often is busy killing their trying to kill their curious obsession creature anyway um this is better against drakes and it mainly comes up i think against opposing rekindling phoenix decks so uh, so far i have been very happy with strike and being able to finish off a planeswalker or finish off a nexus deck when they roots near you but still are in lightning strike range is pretty important and is not being a blank against control and then there are two collision colossus most other lists i've seen run three um, but there's really no room these people run 22 lands and that's insanity i'm talking about that in a moment but yeah collision colossus actually pretty awesome it is sort of a removal spell it lets you deal with big problematic flyers tempest Jin, drakes uh, lyra aurelia opposing hellkites in the mirror and if that doesn't come up you just uh, get to use it as pseudo removal in combat when the opponent is blocking or just as four damage uh, to the face to finish off an opponent um, prematurely or as a surprise card has been pretty good and i totally would run the third if i had another slot but um, there really isn't and yeah then we have 23 lands slightly leaning towards forests because we have eight uh green one drops that we need to play turn one and we that puts us at 12 turn one green sources which is the bare minimum that i feel comfortable with ideally you probably would want um 13 or even a bit more but so far it has been fine i rarely ever can't play one of these turn one sometimes i end up with a rootbound crack as my only green and one of these one drops which can be awkward but only if you have if it messes up your curve which it doesn't always and the problem is you have a double red four drop and a double red five drop so you need enough uh, red sources and 15 red sources is kind of the minimum i feel comfortable with this amount um, 23 is also the bare minimum amount of land that i would play the list that i saw online had 22 which is insane if you're curving up to five old versions of red green dragons a couple years ago in terror standard had 24 lands four lano elves and four two mana uh, accelerants that also uh, could ramp for two ones if you uh, mega morph them so playing any less than 23 is just insane because the curve is exactly the same basically as the old deck 
it goes 4-4 four, four drops, 4-5 four, drops, and the temples are also not really an argument because they help you fix, help you find land and not flood, so they kind of are not a reason to run more or less lands. Um, I really just don't want to cut any other card for 24's land, and the 23 have been playing alright, but I'm still a bit unsure if 23 or 24 is ideal, so I'll leave that to you. If I would add a 24th land, it would probably be a mountain over a forest, simply to make Phoenix and Hellkite a bit more consistent, because they sometimes have a lot of green, because Land of Elf also produces green, and so far I only, I think I had a bit more often issues to find the second red for one of these, than play these turn one, but it is close. I could also see a 9-7 uh, at 24. And yeah, 12, 22 lands is just insanity and a good way to cripple your chances because you really want to curve out and need that 4th or 5th land. And the deck has some decent uh, usage for the land with, uh, for the extra lands with Gross Chamber Guardian and Hellkite's ability, uh, more so even than the old or a similar amounts as the old Red Green Dragon, which had the Mega Morph package. So, yeah, this is the list. This is the main deck. Let's talk about the sideboard. Sideboard is 3 Lava Coil as additional removal, either to have more removal or to upgrade the removal package when Lightning Strike isn't great, like against um, Is it Drakes. Um, is it Drakes is the matchup where you usually swap it against most other decks you just add it in addition to the Lightning Strikes. Um, it is a um, yeah, very efficient and flexible answer, and also answers cards like Wicked Link Phoenix that otherwise might be an issue. Then we have the anti-enchantment, anti-combo package of three Cinder Vines and three Brontodon. They are very important to deal with Search Force, Counter, and Wilderness Reclamation out of the Nexus decks, primarily. They also can come in handy, um, either Brontodon or sometimes both, against decks like Gates that have a Guild Summit, but uh, Cinder Vines is probably a bit too weak because they don't have that many targets, and the other uh, effect of Cinder Vines isn't that good here. But against the Nexus Combo decks, this card is amazing. It's the single best card you can run, and if you see it a lot, I would consider running four. The reason why I have three and three is because Brontodon is a bit more flexible, can come in in more matchups, also against white decks with cards like Excellence Binding and Seal Away and stuff, and also is a threat, so if they don't have a target, it's not blank. Um, and drawing multiples makes it also less bad. And it also doubles as a sideboard card against Mono Red, since a 3 mana 3 4 is actually really good against Mono Red, and one of the better cards you can run in the sideboard without getting too narrow. And uh, it lines up well against uh, Mono Red, basically, since against Mono Red, you basically bring in 3 Brontodon and uh, 3 Lava Coil. And then take out the four Hellkites and the two Collision Colossus uh, for those to lower your curve and just be a bit higher toughness um, to make their life harder. Then we have two Fiery Cannonade. They're almost exclusively meant for White Weenie and maybe like some fringe token decks if you see them. Do not bring them in against Mono Red or Mono Blue. They're way too clunky and they uh, both run for pirates and only so many creatures that die to this anyway. That's where you have your Lava Coils and your Lightning Strikes. This is exclusively for go white uh, token white base decks like White Weenie and maybe some Selesnia or Selesnia plus X tokens, which is probably not a thing at this point. So uh, don't use this too much. It's a pretty narrow sideboard card, which is why there are only two. Then we have two Vivian Reed, another card that some people are running and that is a serious contender for this slot or in addition is Domri. Um, Domri is um, a bit more powerful against control since the minus three gives you um, two cards if you hit, which is really powerful. But uh, Vivian, Vivian's card advantage ability being the plus one, ramping you towards the ultimate, is a pretty nice uh, thing. And Domri's um, plus ability being weaker than Vivian's minus ability uh, is one thing. And the other thing is you can plus one Vivian, like over two turns, Vivian does the same amount of card advantage as Domri does, while Domri gives you two right away, but then the next turn you have to plus it. So over two turns, they both give you two cards, but Vivian can also find lands if you need a land, which you rarely, which you usually don't if you have her. So that's kind of a moot point. Um, 
To be fair, Domri's plus one giving Riot to a creature can be really nice against control, giving your non-haste creatures haste, but that only matters so much. It mainly matters with Rekindling Phoenix. The other good attackers already have um, Riot. Warboss can also sometimes matter, because getting the Mentor right away is nice, but giving haste to something like a Pelt Collector or a Rose Chamber Guardian is pretty marginal. So that doesn't do that much. Um, Domri being one mana cheaper uh, is a thing, but yeah, Vivian being a removal against something like a Lyra or an Ixalan's Binding, and also being a bit more flexible and being able to come in in a couple more matchups, and also being able to deal with something like a Wilderness Reclamation or a Cressus out of a Nexus deck, for example, are all pluses, which I, which is why I am on Vivian. I think you probably want the two Vivians for sure in the sideboard. So if you would want Domri, uh, you would it would probably be an addition because you want like four cards against control. The other two cards against control that I'm currently running are Banefire um, instead of say the Domri that I mentioned, simply because Banefire is a bit more flexible. It can come in as a removal if need be. It can serve as a removal against something like a Lyra uh, out of a control deck postboard, which some decks bring in. It also uh, acts as a finisher, it actually kills your opponent, because uh, you sometimes can't win the grindy game. It also um, can finish off one of their planeswalkers, um, like Bane firing a Teferi is a thing, and it's something that I've done occasional, occasionally, and it's also better against uh, the Nexus decks than the Domri would be. Domri is not very good there, but Banefire actually kills them in the last turn where they might uh, buy themselves the critical turn they need with a Root Snare and then win the next turn, you can just Banefire their face and finish them off. Um, so while Banefire is a bit clunky and a bit um, yeah, unspectacular in the sense that it's kind of sitting in, in your hand unless it kills your opponent, um, it has proven more flexible in terms of matchups where it's useful, which is why I think two Banefire, two Vivian is the better package against control. Um, yeah, that's the deck, that's the 75. Once again, if you run the deck in best of one, play the exact same main deck, just without the sideboard, nothing really changes. Um, also, don't cut a land if you play this in best of one. Be glad that the algorithm uh, makes the 23 work closer to the 24 uh, than how it would work with 24 in uh, best of three. And that's it. There's no need to cut a land. It will just make your deck worth. Yeah, uh, this was a bit longer deck tech, pretty in-depth. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you think. And I'll be back with three matches of traditional rank best of three in diamond with this to show you how to pilot it and how it does. See you in a moment with the first match. Stay tuned.